my name is Merve Ispahani. I'm the Academic Programs Coordinator at Columbia Global Centers Istanbul. I would like to say a warm welcome to you all. Today, uh, we are glad to continue our webinar series, Voices of Emerging Scholars, uh, with our uh, second uh, discussion on politics and archaeology. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time, uh, but I just would like to remind you that we will have a Q&A session in the end of our uh, panel. Uh, so please feel free to post your questions on the Q&A box uh, during the uh, talks. Now I would like to leave the floor to uh, Professor Celik for her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Welcome to our ninth webinar, Politics of Archaeology 2. We started the Voices of Emerging Scholars series back in January with another Politics of Archaeology panel. I'm pleased to report that the papers for that panel are about to be published in the Journal of Turkish and Ottoman Studies Association, together with the reports from the three more sessions that followed. And let me start with the wording of the title. As our discussant, Professor Zainab Bahrani pointed out in an earlier meeting, there is no archeology span without politics. She's right on. However, history of archeology, span which takes politics into consideration is only recent. The papers we will hear today are products of the school that pays attention to the entanglements of the two. As always, my gratitude goes to my dear colleagues at Columbia Istanbul Global Center, Ipek Cem Taha, the director, Merve Tezcanlı Isfahani, academic programs coordinator, and Sadan Gürlek, program officers, officer, and to Jennifer Leitner for his generous sponsorship. I thank our participants, Özge Aslan Mirza, Sebastian Willert, Ceren Abi, and Mustafa Kemal Baran for their fine research and intriguing arguments. We're most grateful to Professor Bahrani for accepting to be our discussant. Pro Professor Bahrani's contribution brings provocative perspectives and expands the intellectual boundaries of our panel. Özge Aslan Mirza reveals another aspect of a figure we know well, Mark Sykes. His fame derives from, the, from dividing the Middle East into French and British mandates in 1916, together with Francois-Georges Picot. As a young man, Sykes dabbled in archeological and some ethnographic research in the Middle East and used his experiences toward a political career. Sebastian Villet underlines the international rivalries between Western powers over Ottoman antiquities, specifically between Germans and Americans. I'm especially happy to learn about Sebastian's research, which complements from the German side, the American documents I revealed a few years ago. Jerenabi turns to the unique case of Istanbul under the occupation of the Allied forces following World War I and makes compelling arguments about the delicate negotiations between Europeans and Ottomans over antiquities. These three papers come together nicely, tracing the earlier arguments on a key question which continues to raise much controversy, who owns antiquities? They also form a neat chronological package covering the first two decades of the 20th century. Our last presenter, Kemal, jumps ahead three decades and looks at the practice of archaeology in Anatolia from a new angle. He examines personal relationships and the impact of the digs on neighboring communities. As to the sources. While the familiar Ottoman archives, mainly Başbakanlık Arşivi, continue to play central roles in the research, others enter the scene. Among them, archives of foreign affairs of France and of Britain, and German museum archives, as well as those located in universities. 
Legal documents, scholarly journals of the time, and travelogues also serve as crucial primary sources. Let me now introduce our speakers in the order they will present. Özge Aslan Mirza received her BA and MA degrees from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. She is currently pursuing her PhD at the Department of History of Kocaeli University on a scholarship from Tübitak while working as a research assistant. Özge completed her first year as a doctoral student at Binghamton University on a Fulbright scholarship. Her research focuses on British knowledge production on the Ottoman Middle East. Sebastian Willert is doctoral fellow at Orient Institute uh, Istanbul and a PhD candidate at uh, Technical University, that's correct, right, TU Berlin, just about to defend his thesis. He earned an MA in history with a thesis on the German-Turkish Commando Movement Protection, Commando for Monument, I'm going to say this again, German-Turkish Commando for Monument Protection. His dissertation analyzes the role of antiquities as subjects of conflict between Germans and Ottomans from 1898 to 1918. His research focuses on the valorization, instrumentalization, and translocation of cultural objects in the 19th and 20th centuries. Jaren Abi received her PhD from history at UCLA and her MA in European history from Leiden University with a special European program at the University of Paris I, Sorbonne, and Oxford University. She works on the cultural and social history of the Middle East and North Africa, the, the late Ottoman Empire, the First World War, and heritage issues, especially in times of armed and social conflict. She is, a, she is currently a visiting scholar at Kadir Has University in Istanbul. Mustafa Kemal Baran recently defended his PhD at the Archaeology and History of Art Department in Koch University. He holds a BA in Industrial Design and an MA in History from the Middle East Technical University, Ankara. He has another master's degree in Classical Archaeology from the University of Oxford, where he held the Ertegun Graduate Scholarship. I have to check something. Okay, good. Um, his research focuses on the history of archaeological practice and heritage in Turkey, with a particular interest in local communities and labor. Our discussant, Zeynep Bahrani, is the Edith Poroda Professor of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. She specializes in ancient Western Asian and East Mediterranean art and archaeology, as well as art history, historiography, and philosophies of representation. In addition to her many publications on these subjects, Professor Bahrani has written on the destruction of Iraqi cultural heritage. Monument preservation and conservation uh, is also a focus of her work. She currently directs the survey project Mapping Mesopotamian Monuments, as well as the restoration and conservation of the Ahmadiyya Gate and rock reliefs in Iraqi Kurdistan. And let us start with um, uh, Özge right away. In the short course, my topic is about the integration of a British aristocrat, namely Mark Seiss, into politics with his amateur research in the field of archaeology. Mark Seiss was an eminent British diplomat and agent known by the Sykes-Pico Agreement 1916, which led to the partition of the Middle East. He was an active figure in the creation of mandate regimes in the region after the end of World War I. He was known as, as a specialist of the Middle East due to his frequent travels, although he was a lay scholar. 
He had attended diverse schools, both in Britain and abroad, and he dropped out of Cambridge University. However, he was passionate and curious about history, archaeology, geography, and linguistics. His aristocratic background provided him opportunities, including traveling and conducting amateur research in the Middle East. My paper will present Mark Sy's use of archaeology as a political tool based on, based on archival sources, namely the papers of Mark Sykes in Hull University. I made use of the microfilm versions in the Turkish, Turkish Historical Foundation and the Prime Minister's State Archive. Mark Sykes was the son of a world wanderer and trader, Tatun Sykes, who was particularly fascinated by the charm of the Middle East. He had read popular Orientalist books such as the Arabian Nights, translated by Richard Burton, traveled with his father to the Middle East and was enchanted by his Cambridge professor's knowledge of antiquity. As gleaned from Mark Sy's writings, his father was familiar with the local people of the Middle East. For instance, in 1888, when he made his first trip to Egypt, Mark Sy stated that he learned about the antiquities of the region from the Sirdar, Lord Greenfell, who had close relations with the Sykes family. In the travel, which is subject of this presentation, Mark Sykes' grandson conveys that during the journey, he befriended the sheikhs of different tribes who told him of the local sites, kept him fed and watered, and more importantly, gave him their protection. A year later, that when he went to Jerusalem, he related that one of the old sheikh fella recognized me and shouted to the crowd that I was his son. This example indicates the close relationship between Sykes and the locals and gives clue of how locals perceive Sykes. Although the travel notes of Tatum Sykes didn't reach the present day, it is likely that Mark Sykes' father was engaged in intelligence gathering activities, which shaped the future of his son. Like the father, Mark Sykes was able to safely travel in different regions throughout the Middle East. He worked with an experienced droga man for a long time named Isa Kubrisli, who knew the region very well. Kubrisli was an experienced guide serving Lord Shamsford in the Abyssinian campaign and accompanied Sir Charles Wilson to Mount Sinai. The journey, which is the subject of this paper, took place when he was 19 years old in 1898. It was also the time when the small scale exploration switched into systematic and large scale ones. The original notes kept during the journey and his related sketches are among the papers of Mark Sykes under the title of Journey from Jericho to Damascus. His notes and observations were published as an article in the 1890 issue of Palestine Exploration Quarterly, the Journal of Palestine Exploration Fund. The Palestine Exploration Fund is important in the sense that it was founded in 1865 when Burton was attempting various strategies which also included archaeological research to secure its frontiers. The article, Journey from Jericho to Damascus, consists of his observations on the geography of Syria and Haran, besides the modus vivendi of Arabs, Caucasians, Bedouins, and other local people as well as their culture. He had typical colonial and orientalist perspectives. For instance, he commented on Circassians that they had rough manners. He added that pr primitive Bedouins stood in aid of eating tools such as forks and knives. Sykes also mentioned that during his travel, he found four inscriptions and copied them. However, he didn't give any details about their content. His attention was focused rather on a huge mass of bones and lava cake with bones, which he later called the heel of bones. He took some samples and photographs to be investigated later. In addition, he found the fragments of pottery and the glass of bracelets and took notes of some inscriptions. However, he did not mention their content either. The end note that British paleontologist Edwin Tulay Nipton wrote to Sykes' article commented that the bones belonged to horncores, a Syrian domestic animal resembling a goat. As you see in the slide, it is the sketch of the finding of Sykes that is mentioned by Nipton. 
Stalin Newton added that they could be of recent origin or go back as far as prehistoric times and that they were probably exposed to heat resulting from a possible fire or volcanic eruption. Upon his return, Sykes gave lectures to Fisher Society and the Cambridge Society of Antiquaries. A letter he sent to Henry Chomley, his cousin, stated that the Royal Geographical Society found the discovery of the bones as of greatest importance. Sykes also underlined that he was the first person to enter the site of the discovery. Upon obtaining a permission from the Ottoman authorities in 1899, he took a leave of absence from Cambridge to continue archaeological investigations. His permission letter stated that he was interested in antiquaries, Asara Atika, and that a few years ago he had been to Hauran and Syria, where he found, had found bones and Greek, ins Greek ins inscriptions in the desert. He later, he, he, the letter expressed his wish to travel Hauran again to determine the date of bones. However, he did not receive the permits and ended up visiting Aleppo, Baghdad, Mosul, Wal, Van, Erwan, and Batum. The outcome of this journey was his book, Through Five Turkish Provinces, published in the 90s. In this book, he shared his observations on the local people and culture. He criticized the Ottoman administration associating po political instability with robbery in Mosul, where, due to lack of authority, no governor was appointed after the keys of the last. He again revealed his Orientalist approach to the Middle Eastern people by using civilization as a measuring stick. For instance, not only did he take the liberty, liberty to hit an old beggar who cursed the religion of Sykes and his servants with a stick, but he stated proudly that he, the beggar, might have repented it in civility. The book brought him praising reviews and served as one of the first steps toward building his reputation as a Middle East expert, and he drew attention of politicians and policymakers. My brief presentation highlights Sykes' initiation into British politics, materializing in 1911 when he became a member of the parliament. The process had started with his recognition in archaeology in affiliation with prominent institutions such as the Royal Geographical Society and the Palestine Exploration Fund. In this respect, he resembled Henry Layard, whose fame depended on his discoveries in Nineveh, but whose true career was intelligence service for the British Empire, aimed at defending British interests in the Eastern Ottoman provinces. Unlike Layard, Mark Sykes did not make a prominent debate with archaeology, and his amateur attempts resulted in limited archaeological research. His forte was politics. Now I will give the floor to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Elske. Uh, the German archaeologist and museum director Theodor Wiegand visited the Museum Ayun in Istanbul on July 2, 1913. The director of the Royal Museum's Department of Antiquities was aware of a rumor quote, that the Turks wanted to pledge the museum's collection to America. As Zeynep Celik noted in her book about antiquities, the rumor about the possibility of selling the collection had already reached the United States in November 1912. While interest from Berlin and Vienna was feared at New York's Metropolitan Museum, the Royal Museums, together with German diplomats, politicians, and financial representatives, took action. There were three impediments to the Royal Museum's acquisitions of antiquities from the Ottoman Empire. The German-Ottoman agreement on the division of fines of 1899 remained ineffective. The 1906 antiquities law had made an, any legal export of antiquities from Ottoman soil almost impossible. And the fact that the Berlin Museums had lost their powerful agent, Abdul Hamid II, in the aftermath of the 1908 revolution. In the summer of 1913, German actors saw an opportunity to appropriate the Museum Mayun's most important finds. Financially strapped, Ottoman civil servants approached the German embassy in July 1913. Subsequently, between summer 1913 and spring 1914, secret negotiations occurred in Istanbul. In the following, I examine the genesis of the negotiations, the actors involved, and finally, the effects. 
Towards the end of the Second Balkan War, the Ottoman Empire found itself in a political, financial, and military state of emergency. Adrianople was occupied by Bulgarian troops, and Istanbul needed financial liquidity to maintain the possibility of re recapturing it. During the war, Ottoman Minister of fi Finance, Abdurrahman Vefik Sayan, turned to first dragoman of the German embassy in Istanbul, Theodor Weber, who, according to an anecdote in the records of the German archaeologist Martin Schede, casually said, quote, if you need money, why not sell the museum, end of quote. Although the minister initially refused to do so, he sent his agent shortly afterwards to verify the validity of the offer. On July 6, 1913, German ambassador Hans von Wangenheim telegraphed to Berlin and asked whether there was an interest in a loan transaction on the Museum Mayun's collection. A report followed the cable one day later. The document has the phrase, despite official denials, but does not clarify where these came from or what they involved. The cable stated, and I quote, here, despite official denials, the rumor persists that a loan is planned under pledge of local museum collections. Mosel claimed to have a reliable source that private negotiations with an American company were underway. I assume that irresponsible but influential authorities want to bring about the deal, end of quote. Assuming that Deutsche Bank would be a potential suitor, the Foreign Office forwarded the message on the same day to its board spokesman, Arthur von Gwinner. In Istanbul, Talat Pasha came apparently unsolicited to speak on the museum matter and expressed a willingness to come to a financial agreement. In consequence, according to this correspondence, the collection of the Museum Ayun was on the verge of translocation to Berlin. But Wangenheim assumed that the Sublime Port had made the same offer to other powers. Therefore, the possibility of realizing the deal even without German participation was to be expected, and the ambassador urged for haste. Wiegand was informed and noted in his diary, I quote, I had to tell myself, rather than the objects going to America, they should go to Berlin, end of quote. After Wiegand had consulted the Prussian Minister of Culture, August von Trotz zu Solz, the board members of Deutsche Bank, Arthur von Gwinner, Paul Mankiewicz, and Oskar Wassermann met with the museum director and his assistant, Martin Schede, on July 15th. The bank was willing to provide 10 million Reichsmark to purchase the main parts of the, the Ottoman Museum, especially the finds of the Sidonian necropolis and 12 of the best statues. A German delegation under the leadership of Fritz von Liebermann was established and traveled via Odessa to Istanbul. It reached the Ottoman capital on July 20th where the first meeting at the German embassy took place on July 21st. Wiegand used his political skills to accentuate the fact that the involvement of Deutsche Bank and Royal Museums should be avoided at all costs during the negotiations. From the Ottoman side, Arif Bey, president of the Bar Association, and the Armenian businessman Leon Bey were sent as mediators. On July 26th, Schäder reported to Berlin that the following was to be acquired for the sum of 10 million marks. First, all objects of the Sudonian royal necropolis, including the so-called Alexander's sarcophagus. Second, the, the entire collection of Christian art from Byzantium, Asia Minor, etc. Third, a selection of the very best and most distinguished other works of art from the Constantinople Museum in marble, bronze, precious metals, ceramics. The German actors assumed that leading Ottoman political functionaries would not attach any value to the collection of the Museum Ayun. As Wiegand expressed in a letter to Schede, and I quote, Helferich is firmly convinced that the matter is for purchase. He knows his Turks, and neither Talat nor Said Halim attach importance to the sarcophagi, etc. End of quote. The recent political changes within the Ottoman capital were taken into account by Wiegand by not going as far as require Islamic objects. But he wanted to take revenge on the Ottoman museum directors and wrote in his diary, I quote, Hamdi and Halil have proven many times that they ruthlessly exploit the foreign scholars. They whole, the, the whole antiquity laws proves it. Islamic objects I will completely balance and leave untouched, end of quote. However, during the negotiations, it became increasingly clear to the Germans that the Ottoman negotiating partners were not eager to actually sell the collection. Apparently, they had found a less painful short-term monetary source and the Ottoman negotiators, hence, 
presented the idea to pawn the objects on condition that they remain in Istanbul. Opposed to earlier initiatives to transport the objects to Berlin, a pawn between 25 and 30 years was negotiated. Should the Supreme Court not be able to pay the sum after the expiry of the period, the objects would become Prussian property. Liebermann, as head of the German delegation, rejected this option and aimed at the translocation of some outstanding objects to Berlin. The German delegation was under time pressure as the Ottoman, the Ottoman side expected a decision by August 4th, 1913, the beginning of Ramazan, to pay salaries to the state officials and officers. In addition, the transaction was threatened by two possible options, a credit of the debt public or a loan granted by a third country. After the debt public, as well as the Rigi company, announced the possibility of large payments, Schede concluded that, and I quote, the big moment was missed. Nevertheless, Karl Helferich referred to the ongoing need for money in Istanbul and thereby underpinned the Royal Museum's hope for concluding a pledge transaction, including the display of prestigious archaeological finds in Berlin. However, negotiations were complicated by the involvement of, uh, of Willem von Bode, Director General of the Royal Museums, and other departments, and especially the Deutsche Orientgesellschaft, the German Orient Society, which insisted on securing the right to the export of excavation finds from Assur. On August 8, 1913, Berlin sent a telegram to its negotiators in Istanbul, authorizing the purchase. The offer was brought to Arif and Leon Base in the evening on the same day. However, negotiations were interrupted four days later, only to be resumed on August 16. The Ottoman shortage of money had increased, and Said Halim asked for greater haste. The Ottomans repeatedly demanded the list of the objects desired by Berlin in order to finalize the negotiations on the condition of the pawn. After receiving the list, the Ottoman side expressed concerns about its scope, that Halil Adam would put up significant resistance, a concern which, according to Schede, had not played in ro a role earlier. On August 22nd, the list was shown to Arif Bey, and handed over to Said Halim the following day. Initially, there was no reaction from the Ottoman side. In September 1913, the, the Sublime Port once again received the sum from the dead public. As of this point, Ottoman reluctance to adhere to the deal became even more obvious. It was clear that Istanbul would accept smaller credit payments from other sources rather than take the risk of losing prestige and give the most important pieces of their antiquities collection to Berlin. Through Ambassador Wangenheim, the German negotiators tried once again to exert pressure on Said Halim, but there was some opposition from the high Ottoman officers, most importantly, the diplomat Osman Nizami. Eventually, as Shere explained, Halil Adhim, who had been silent up until now, expressed, uh, and I quote, a feverish desire to save his museum. After the matter was presented to the Council of Ministers on September 14th, the opposition to the deal had become too powerful. Said Halim was forced to take the matter off the agenda with an uncompromising hope, a promise to the Germans that he, as he said, would try to convince his colleagues afterwards. Although a counter proposal was made on September 24th, Arif Bey withheld it from the German delegation as he perceived its content as unfavorable. The sale of the museum had failed and eventually German negotiators around uh, argued for the need to compensate their travel expenses and unfulfilled hopes. Eventually, they focused on maintaining their permissions to excavate sites and especially the permission to export archaeological finds. Furthermore, Germans were to continue pressuring the Minister of Finance, Javid Bey, who was negotiating with Deutsche Bank in Berlin, but who, according to Wiegand, referred to public opposition to the deal as an obstacle. Enver Pasha, whose influence in Istanbul had increased on the eve of the First World War, turned out to be a fan fanatical opponent of the project. Subsequently, the German delegation suspected that Halil Adam was Enver's main influencer, leading to the rejection of the project. On March 2, 1914, Said Halim finally informed the German ambassador that, and I quote, the, germ the museum business can no longer be done. To conclude, the German actors regarded the negotiations for the purchase of the museum collection as a chance to acquire significant and celeb celebrated objects. Thus, an orchestra of archaeologists, museum representatives, diplomats, politicians, and representatives of the Deutsche Bank pursued the negotiations for the purchase of the museum collection. 
When Berlin and Istanbul negotiated on the amount of compensation to be paid by the Ottoman Empire for German war efforts in the Ottoman realm in June 1918, Bigand again proposed the debts could be reduced if antiquities from the Museum, Museum Hümeyun were ceded to the Royal Museums in Berlin. The idea of acquiring prestigious objects from Istanbul as part of financial negotiations lived on, but was not implemented as diplomats raised objections against Vigan's proposal. Nevertheless, many questions are left unanswered. I could not find any documentation from the Ottoman side, neither in the Bashbakan Lik Archivi, correspondence between Halil Adam and German archaeologists, nor in diaries of the prominent Ottoman figures. There is no secondary literature on the negotiations yet. In consequence, the intentions of Talak Pasha and Said Halim, as well as the arguments of the, the Ottoman opposition around Osman Nizami and Halil Adem, are left in the dark. After this conclusion, I now leave the floor to Jeren Abi. Yes. In this paper, I will focus on uh, archaeological activities of the Allied forces during the occupation of the Ottoman lands, specifically Istanbul after the World War I. I will address questions about uh, archaeology under occupation. Uh, uh, three questions to be exact. Why did the Allies engage in archaeology in the first place? What did they do with the antiquities they found? What, uh, why did the Allies not ship archaeological finds in Istanbul to Europe, given that they did so uh, elsewhere in the empire? I will begin by discussing the war, the occupation, and the archaeological activities in the Ottoman Empire in general, and then focus on Istanbul. It is well known that all parties uh, that fought on the Ottoman lands carried out archaeological activities during the war. Why would they do so in the midst of a brutal global conflict? Why do so during an occupation? Um, I present two, three reasons. Uh, firstly, to stake territorial claims, uh, or at least delineate a zone of influence. Secondly, to legitimize their occupation. And thirdly, to take advantage of an exceptional opportunity to produce knowledge, as well as to send antiquities uh, back to Europe, uh, which did they, uh, they did not do so in Istanbul. The Allies claimed that they had deep cultural roots in the Ottoman lands uh, and that they were the true successors of the ancient civilizations that, uh, that had developed there. This in turn provided with them uh, the, with the rationale uh, for the occupation. There was precedent to this, uh, capitalizing on the past to assert such territorial claims, such as by the French forces uh, in Egypt in the late 18th century and the French and Italian ones in North Africa in late uh, 19th and 20th centuries. When Napoleon occupied Egypt, he claimed uh, uh, he relied on his uh, savants and the study of the Ottoman past to legitimize his invasion. Later, uh, French and Italian governments used the Ottoman past to make a case for their colonization of North Africa. During the occupation of East Asia Minor in the early years of the First World War, Russia had asserted its claim to be the legitimate heir of the Byzantine Empire and initiated excavations. In 1919, when the Greek army this time occupied the western coast of Asia Minor, it was accompanied by a contingent of archaeologists who collected antiquities with the intention of providing uh, the essential, uh, proving um, uh, the essential Greekness of the lands. Meanwhile, Italians who had a long cultural interest in the same territories attempted to establish their own historical claim by virtue of archaeological studies into the Roman past. The Allies also tried uh, to accomplish uh, these same goals uh, through civilizing mission tactics. For example, the French military established a museum in Adana, while uh, Italian forces established a museum in Antalya. Ottomans already uh, collected antiquities in Adana, so this claim was uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, but according to the French, the, col uh, the French colonel in charge of the museum, it was the French thing to do uh, in order to protect antiquities. 
Both the French and the Italian museum makers underscore the contributions of the local population uh, to the museological efforts. And the, the, the museums uh, were presented as having civilized these occupied lands and show the importance of protecting local antiquities. The presumed act acceptance of the museums by the locals, it was implied, legitimized foreign occupation. The occupation was also framed as an exceptional opportunity in the words of the director of the British Museum, Sir Kenyon, for British interest and archaeological research in general. By 1915, when the Allied armies began fighting in the Ottoman lands, the British were already conducting excavations in Mesopotamia, French in Gallipoli, and they were shipping their finds and thus breaching the Ottoman laws back to Britain and France. Ottoman laws were very strict about expatriation of uh, archaeological finds. The Ottoman Antiquities Law of uh, 1884 had decreed, uh, declared that the old antiquities to be state property and strictly banned their exportation. Any excavations conducted in Ottoman soil required a permit. Thus, theoretically, allied archaeolo archaeological activities during the war and occupation and expatriation of uh, any fines were illegal. Moreover, the Article 56 of 1899 Hague Convention, uh, which was about the laws of customs of war, a prohibited seizure of uh, historical monuments, works, works of art, and sciences. Uh, Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire, they, they were all signatories to this 1899 Hague Convention. Now let us turn our attention to Istanbul. Allied forces, comprised of uh, Americans, British, Greek, French, and Italian forces, occupied the city from uh, 1918 to 23. In Istanbul, it was the French who conducted excavations, working in Gülhane in Makriköy, today's Bakırköy, on Byzantine remains. During these activities, uh, there existed at least nominal collaboration between the European excavators and the Euro uh, Ottoman authorities, a type of, type of relationship that dated back to the 19th century. The Ottomans attempted to maintain con control of discoveries and movement of fines by issuing law and regulations. Um, and uh, as, as I mentioned, the 1884 Ottoman uh, uh, law stopped the practice of dividing the fines between excavators and the um, Ottoman state and prohibited the exportation of uh, historical facts. Starting with Antiquities, Antiquities Law of 74, uh, the Ottomans sent inspectors to the excavation sites. Um, and um, uh, to control uh, the, the digs and the record any fines. Similar actions were undertaken to keep an eye on the French excavations and to upload the Ottoman laws. The practice was supported by the Article 43 of the uh, Hague Convention of 1907, which decreed that the occupiers must respect the laws of in force in, in, in any country that they, anyone occupies. Meanwhile, the Ottomans and the occupying archaeologists maintain a scholarly relationship. For example, Theodor Makredi Bey, an Ottoman official and the archaeologist uh, of the Ottoman uh, Imperial Museum, co-authored uh, articles with French archaeologists archaeologists. The association of Makredi Bey, I'm sorry, and the, um, uh, the other Ottoman officials uh, with the French archaeologists predated the war. Furthermore, the Ottoman officials engaged in civil gestures with uh, occupying forces. Nonetheless, due to the changing power dynamic between the Ottoman authorities and the foreign archaeologists during the occupation, the nature of French excavations became contentious. The French argued that the excavations were mutually agreed by the, uh, by, by the French and the director of the uh, Ottoman Imperial Museum, Halil Atembe, via exchange of letters. Following the law, the French would excavate in the name of the Imperial Museum and uh, send antiquities they found to the Imperial Museum. And indeed, the evidence shows that the French did exactly that uh, and not send it back home like they did uh, elsewhere in the empire during the occupation and in Greece during the war. So my question is, why follow one, ex uh, one practice here uh, elsewhere and not in Istanbul? I offer several hypotheses. Firstly, unlike in Mesopotamia, the allies had not made territorial claims on Istanbul. Secondly, because not, um, 
because not being able to have a clear prediction of, of Istanbul's future status, they needed to ensure a long-term workable relationship with the Ottoman authorities. Uh, for example, the French wanted to establish a school in, uh, in Istanbul and the negotiations about that started in this period. Thirdly, uh, each um, of the allied countries was keeping an eye on each other's activities. Fourthly, uh, in Istanbul, their civilizing mission argument made not much sense. The city already boasted a major museum and had established many initiatives to preserve and protect antiquities. Furthermore, the Ottomans uh, pressured the allies constantly, writing frequent reports and keeping detailed re records of the um, excavations. Uh, finally, Istanbul uh, at the time was under international spotlight. The world was watching and allied forces did not want the world to view them as barbarians. This concern about international perception of their activities was linked to a wartime shift in public attitudes regarding the protection of cultural heritage. The German destruction of cultural monuments in Belgium in 1914 had created a, a widespread outcry. European and American opinion reflected the need to safeguard cultural monuments and antiquities. Moreover, the powerful new war technologies contribute to, to unearthing of many antiquities. As a result, uh, many monument protection initiatives were adopted by the belligerents. Uh, this one is from the Ottoman uh, German uh, monument uh, commando unit, which uh, Sebastian can say a, a lot more about it. Uh, during the war, um, along with uh, monument protection initiatives, allied armies also issued many regulations regarding cultural heritage uh, in occupied territories. They declared ant antiquities to uh, be under their guardianship and used these regulations to prevent damage, destruction, and looting. After the war, they decided to tread very, very carefully and when possible by pursuing changes in the law. So throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, the European archaeologists pushed against the increasing limitations the Ottomans introduced to the division and export of antiquities. The Allies aimed to transform the existing legal status quo during the occupation. The Serb Treaty signed in 1920 between the Allies and the Ottomans serve as a key statement to, to this effort. According to Article 421 of the treaty, and I quote, the Turkish government will, uh, within 12 months from the coming into the force of the present treaty, abrogate the existing law of antiquities and take necessary steps to enact a new law of antiquities. Moreover, the Sir Treaty legalized the partitioning and expatriation of fines. Article 8 of the relevant annex decrees that the proceeds of excavations may be divided between excavator and the Ottoman state. In 1921, in accordance with the Sir Treaty, Halibe drafted an antiquities draft bill. Articles 15 and 29 follow the Sir Treaty and allow the division and exportation of antiquities. Both the treaty and the draft antiquities law of 21 suggest a return to the Ottoman antiquities law of 1874, which also uh, allowed the partition on export of fines. So the return to the practice of partition reflects a change in the power dynamics. The fact that Halil Etem, who had really fought hard against the expatriation of antiquities, uh, subsequently authored the 1921 draft bill, attest to the enormous amount of pressure imposed by the occupation on the Ottoman authorities and also shows the importance placed on archaeology by the occupiers. The Serb Treaty and the draft bill were cancelled in 1923 with the advancement of the Turkish nationalist movement in Anatolia. In sum, the relationship between archaeology and politics is intricate and becomes even more charged during turbulent times, as I attempted to show in this paper. The Allies gained an advantage during their joint occupation of Istanbul, and the Ottomans, who had a limited arsenal of strategies to deploy against them, oscillated between collaboration and negotiation in an effort to control the flow of antiquities outside the empire. On the one hand, the occupiers had enough power to disregard Ottoman law uh, and conduct uh, lots of archaeological excavations out, uh, outside and inside Istanbul, while also pushing for new antiquities law. 
But on the other hand, they were reluctant to ship antiquities, uh, their finds from Istanbul abroad and sought Ottoman approval for their activities. All of this point towards an idiosyncratic power dynamic in the occupied city of Istanbul. Halil Atem's antiquities draft bill was never put into effect. And as the political military climate changed, the allies quit the city in 1923. Despite all of the talk about the international protection of antiquities, a comprehensive law to protect antiquities uh, in armed conflict would have to wait until the end of the Second World War. Thank you. And now I'm uh, leaving the floor to um, our uh, friend, uh, uh, doc Dr. Uh, Kemal, and uh, I'll stop sharing my uh, screen. Thank you, Jadan. Um, writing from the town of Polatlı in Ankara, near the ancient city of Gordian, Cemal Dinçer, a fourth grader at the time, talks about his day, his studies, and even expresses his desire to go to the United States the following year. The letter was addressed to Magdad Melik, a professor of archaeology originally from the Netherlands, but teaching in the US. Known for her erudite scholarship, Hale Chambal, a contemporary of Melik, describes her accessible attitude by saying, and I quote, uh, not only with her students, but with all those who are genuinely interested, excited, and serious in their undertaking, Maktad would generously give her time and her immense knowledge and share her thoughts with them, end quote. With the letter, Dinchar included a photo of himself, the one, on the, the one you see on the screen. The photo he wrote was an exchange for a research he wants as a memory or souvenir. The letter does not indicate the exact nature of uh, Jamal Dinch's relationship with Magdad Menik. In 1953, when the letter was authored, she was teaching at Birmingham College and was involved with the Phrygian capital Gordian, where the University of Pennsylvania Museum has been conducting a research project. Dinchar may have been the son of a workman at the excavation, or he may have met her around the site or the dig house, which was located at the edge of the village Yasuik. While Jamal Dinchar does not appear to have taken an active role in excavation work, he was nevertheless part of the network of relationships it created. Drawing from critical heritage studies, I take an expansive definition of archaeological practice, which includes communities living near or next to the ongoing projects and the daily life interactions of its participants beyond the trenches. Through the documents presented here, I will try to show a microcosm of archaeology containing several layers reaching down to the members of local communities. The body of material I'm focusing on in my paper today comes from Professor Magdad Manning's personal archive at Brimmore College. The specific folder from which the documents are drawn is titled 1952-1956. Without any indication to its content on the online finding aid, however, the physical folder had the label Turkish letters written on it, as we can see on the slide. Noted for their skillful penmanship, the authors of the documents in this folder are quite diverse and include schoolboys, men from the local community involved in the archaeological projects, such as the Gözlükule Mount in Tarsus Mersin and the ancient city of Gordian, a prominent politician who wants to share his enthusiasm for archaeology, a policeman who works near Troy, and a married couple who complain about each other. The letters are all from men, except for two, Jebai Saigasis, who sent the letter that she wrote with her husband, and Asiye Suad. The documents are mostly in Turkish and are in response to Menlik's letters. The dispatch addresses of the letters align with Menlik's archaeological research and are from places near excavation sites. Additionally, there are letters from places where she might have visited before or after fieldwork, such as Beşir Konya or Kalkan Antalya. There is relatively little mention of archaeology or fieldwork directly in this folder. A common feature of these documents is a series of requests addressed to Melink. Such was the case in an unnamed New Year's card that reads, We wish you happiness for the new year. I could not meet you when you had arrived. I bought the metal sheet 
it costs 50 lira. In this code, one can trace archaeology in the mention of material apparently bought as part of the fieldwork. The correspondence with Muslim Uyghur proves the exception and shows clues regarding the ways in which Uyghur, as a member of the local community, took part in the archaeological practice. Between the years of 1957 and 1964, Uyghur sent five letters to Menik, two of which do not indicate the year, but only the day of the month. While the documents do not fully reveal the nature of the work Muslim Uyghur did in the excavation, in a letter dated October 23, 1957, Uyghur wrote that he worked in the ceramics room until the end of the season, fieldwork season, with a certain El Bayan, presumably Ellen Calder, the staff member responsible for records and laboratory work. In his letters, Uyghur gives periodic updates on the developments in Gordian, often in detail, and is apparent from the text that Menlik has specifically asked for these updates. Short reports on the archaeological work are on the big tumulus, the focus of research in Gordian, as well as the small mound where Menlik carried out her own fieldwork. Uyghur's reporting from the site uh, went beyond mere observation. For instance, in a letter dated March 12, 1960, Uyghur talks about photography and mentions that he has not been following up on the habit and barely took any photos. He nevertheless did send a batch of negatives to Mennik via one of her colleagues he calls Anna Bayan, possibly referring to Ann Knudsen, an archaeologist from UPenn who participated in the excavation that year. At first glance, Mennik's request for updates on the archaeological work carried out in a project where she was a senior member until the 1960s, might come off as rather curious. The fieldwork commenced in Gordian in 1950 with the initiative of Rod Neon of UPenn, who continued as the director until he passed away in 1974. A total of 17 fieldwork seasons were completed by his death, however, with sporadic breaks, such as in the years of 1954 and 1958, when the American team did not come to Turkey. The, date of, the dates of Uyghur's letters do not always align with these off-seasons, and the short reports in the letters further indicate ongoing archaeological work. The field reports authored by the director, Rod Nian, demonstrate that Menlik was present during the fieldwork seasons, starting from 1950 through 1960s, and continued her work, particularly on the small mound. However, she was not always present for the whole season, which usually continued from April to the end of August and joined the team after the spring term ended at Bryn Mawr. Thus, her motivation in requesting this information from Uyghur may be related with keeping an eye on the site when the team was not there for possible interventions required by the weather conditions. Uyghur's interest in keeping in touch with Menning is also partly business related. In one of the letters, Uyghur proposed a joint venture to her in which she would loan money to him for a minibus and then he would pay off the amount by working as a driver during the fieldwork season in Elmalı, Antalya, where she was starting a new archaeological fieldwork. As he mentioned in an earlier letter, Uyghur had previously taken a driving, driving course in Polatlı. At the time, he was working as a personal driver of Raji Temizer the director of the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara, and the government representative to the Gordian excavations. As he mentioned in the same letter, he was not with his job as a driver and was looking for other opportunities. Mursin Uyghur's letters depict a figure who was actively involved in different aspects of archaeological work, stretching beyond the fieldwork season and can establish a network of different actors. Uyghur participated in tasks ranging, ranging from working at the ceramics room to keeping an eye on the site and reporting back to Menik. Through his working relationship with Magdad Menik and Raji Temizar, he had agency in different aspects of the archaeological management process, which he appropriated and used it as a stepping stone for new ventures. On a concluding note, I would like to stress a few points that I took from this paper. First, Mainik's interactions with the local communities was established through archaeology, 
but had also personal and professional layers. The documents overall display a nuanced power relationship where Manlik had means and was often in a demanding position regarding the fieldwork. Local communities nevertheless navigated through this web of diverse actors and took part in the archaeological practice. Second, while the documents presented in this paper are authored by the local communities and emphasize their voice and contribution, they still reflect back on Magdad Meni, who chose to keep the documents in the first place. In a paper that tries to move away from the larger than life figures in archaeology, I had to look more into the carriers and archives to be able to find traces of the local communities. Last but not least, the 1952-1956 Turkish Letters folder, as part of the Magdad Menik papers, offers a glimpse into the role and contribution of local communities at heritage sites in Turkey, a crucial aspect of fieldwork and history of archaeological practice. Thank you. I believe now I leave the floor to Professor Bahrain. Thank you. Thank you all um, very much for your papers. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for these four um, noteworthy and original papers. All four papers uh, presented new and quite interesting information based on archival sources that clearly ought to be explored uh, further in the history of archaeology. Ottoman archives in particular are generally neglected uh, by archaeologists uh, who have written about the history of their own field. Professor Celik mentioned at the beginning that uh, the considering the relationship of politics and archaeology together is uh, something relatively recent in the historiography of the discipline. And, and certainly among archeologists, uh, it's rare to uh, consider carefully how their discipline has been formed. But this is now changing. And I think that all of your papers are part of this. All of your papers seem to me to be engaging also with very timely issues. Timely issues, I mean issues that are taking place and are relevant and pressing and urgent today. So although you're speaking about uh, earlier periods, the Ottoman era or the 1950s, there are so many resonances with resonating um, aspects with what is happening today, which I found fascinating. Though each of you is clearly doing this in a different way. In some cases, I was struck uh, by the extent to which er the early 20th century attitudes and practices in general um, that are preserved in these uh, archives are still in place today in the field of ancient Near Eastern archeology. span And my first question is simply to wonder what, when we can ever expect to see a change in the discipline, if at all. especially in the areas of the world um, that used to be former Ottoman lands. So the webinar is described as archaeology and, and politics uh, in order to investigate uh, a particular form of uh, uh, relationship uh, with the past, uh, and that is a, a good direction. How can we better address the fact that ever since its formation as a Western field of scientific knowledge about the past, it has always been in the service of the political and particularly imperial and colonial goals? So that's a larger question that all of you can, can think about and take on about the disciplinary field of archaeology, especially archaeology in, in the regions of the former Ottoman Empire. So now I will turn to asking uh, each of you a couple of short questions uh, to consider along with what I've just mentioned um, and addressed to all of you. So I'll start with Uzge. I'll go in the order that you gave your papers. Uzge, uh, the case of 
a British aristocrat, Mark Sykes. Um, I was really struck by uh, the, many, the many ways in which you described his accounts, and there were really some gems in, in, the, in the content of what you presented. Um, I will start with the statement of uh, he used archaeology as a political tool. You've, you've looked at all of this ar archival information, which is such an important thing to do, and you say, he used archaeology as a political tool, uh, which I thought was an interesting statement, but um, I think that in that case I might push back a little bit and say, well, were there other archaeologists at the time, especially British archaeologists, who were not using archaeology as a political tool, and how does his work relate uh, to theirs? Uh, certainly, he uh, was a well-known uh, political uh, figure and uh, somebody who was gathering intelligence in the region. This is well known about him and well recorded. Uh, and uh, so we know that he, he was working for British intelligence as were a number of other archeologists at the time. Um, but the, the narrative that you present is interesting, especially the, the book that he wrote himself about the travels. And he describes himself and his own relationship to the area. And that was so striking. One of the statements that you made that I thought was really quite beautiful in a way is that you said, and these were your own words, that he used civilization as a stick and he hit a beggar man with it. And that I thought really kind of summed it up for me. Um, and you changed the wording slightly from our previous meeting, but I thought that that was really just spot on. And uh, I, I would love to see you do more, that, more of that kind of um, textual analysis. For example, the other remark that you made, um, which makes me want to ask you about how, how in approaching in such an archive, you can take a position of critical distance is the remark that he makes that everybody loved me in this region, that I had good relationships with everyone. And the Sheikh Fallah even called me his son. So as a speaker of Arabic, I would say if he knew him so well and he loved him so much, how did he not know his name? Because Sheikh Fellah means Sheikh Farmer, right? So, so he clearly didn't even know the name of this man, um, but yet he claimed to have been close to him. So I'm kind of curious about how we can separate, um, in your opinion, the account of himself, his kind of self-fashioning through this uh, narrative of his travels. How can we separate his own self-fashioning from our own, from our scholarly kind of uh, distanced uh, and more critical uh, observations of what he's written? So I will leave it at that and ask you to respond briefly. Okay, thank you so much for the questions. Um, the case of Mark Sy is very, actually interesting to me because we know that uh, there are some other prominent ones like Gertrude Bell or Lawrence that they also uh, kind of um, agents but also they started with uh, their political lives uh, with the interest in archaeology but in the case of Marx he is like as I said a lay scholar and he was like uh, not educated actually because of the frequent travels to around the world and although he attended Cambridge University he dropped out of Cambridge but he uh, created good relationship with his professors like uh, Arabic language professor professors and also the uh, to his tutors in uh, history and languages but the case with the Mark Seiss is that uh, as you brilliantly indicated he is he represents himself in such a way that like uh, when he set foot in the middle east he is admired by everyone 
and you can also see it in his books and also the um, handwritings in the Hull University archives stating that uh, how he was well treated with the uh, tribes of the ships and how they fed them, how they watered them. But also uh, he stated th that um, although they treat him well, treat, uh, treated him well, he said also that commented in his handwritings that uh, the Bedouins are like that, they are savage, they are rough people, and Turks are like, uh, they look kind, I love them, but I actually don't like them because they are intervening the prestige and the um, interest of the Britain, etc. But uh, the thing is that you, as you mentioned, even he said that he was a kind of son of a sheikh, but he also said that sheikh fella, but uh, fella also had a different meaning, like kind of barbaric, some kind of uh, negative connotation. So although he said like that, he even also criticizes that maybe unconsciously, because as we see in the example, he uh, cursed a beggar, you know, because just because he uh, cursed to his religion, by the way, I have to, I must say that he is very he is very rigid and strict strict opinions about his Catholic religion. So uh, that's maybe the reason why he also very angry uh, like that, even for even to a beggar. But the thing is that, in my opinion, by uh, going through he all his sources as I have reached and the uh, books that I have read uh, read about him. Uh, he is like he wants us, wanted to be the first to set foot in the Middle Eastern lands. He was like by everyone because he tries to give a message not to the audience or the uh, uh, readers of the books or his articles or the others, but giving message to the politicians and the policymakers, stating that I am the expert of the Middle East, so I have to take action, and you have to accept me in the important position positions. And it's a kind of um, uh, like uh, there are two life of Mark Sykes, actually, if I say it in a, in a way like that, because firstly, he was very uh, critical about imperialism when he was uh, when he was attended to Boyer War and he uh, wrote some letters to his uh, fiance Edith Sykes, who to be wife later on saying that I hate wars, I hate people who have some interest on other people because there is a war and people are dying and they are so brutal. He said it not, not to the uh, other side of the uh, war attendees, but also for the Britain. And he said that I never wanted to be in politics. But uh, at the same time, he tries to reach the important people through archaeology, as we see, because he tried to get contact with the Royal Geographic Society, Palestine Exploration Fund. And the, the interesting case is that, for example, in the uh, Palestine Exploration Fund, uh, Thomas Lawrence, the, another prominent agent, was also registered then, in, and he produced some works about the Holy Lands in the Middle East. So uh, maybe unconsciously, but I think, uh, and I think for, giving his way to the politics by underlying and uh, clocking it in the different majors. He always wanted to be in politics, but most importantly, wanted to be in politics to have a say on the uh, lands and the people of the Middle East. Thank you, Uska. I could speak about this for a very long time with you, but I think we have to move on. So thank you very much for your uh, reply. Uh, the second speaker was Sebastian Willert, uh, German Ottoman negotiations for the sale of the Musée Humayun, 1913 to 14. Uh, Sebastian, thank you so much. You presented uh, rich, very, very rich archival material that's so interesting. Um, my first question to you is a kind of a, like a minute question, perhaps, but I'm curious. Um, why do you think the involvement of the Deutsche Bank had to be kept quiet? Um, I would love to hear more about that. And uh, the second is, 
the second and kind of broader question I have for you is uh, how you think you can situate uh, this story that you've told us, this kind of microcosm of everything that was going on, which is so fascinating. How can you set it uh, within museum history and within histories of collecting um, in general? So what conclusions can, can you or we draw about the policies and attitudes that existed towards cultural heritage. I'm particularly curious about that, Sebastian, because you have worked on these, uh, whatever they're called, the units for the protection of monuments. So how, how is all of this reconciled with uh, the idea of protecting, protecting monuments and uh, being uh, the proponents for uh, the protection of civilization? Um, thank you very much for your questions. Um, to answer your first uh, question, um, the involvement of the Deutsche Bank and why it has to, uh, had to be kept quiet, I think it's uh, worthwhile to focus on the fact that the co um, quotation I um, found came actually from uh, Theodor Wiegand, who was the um, museum director of the Royal Museums, and he said, that both the Deutsche Bank and the Royal Museums should not be mentioned in the in the course of the um, secret negotiations. And for the part of the Deutsche Bank, I think it's um, necessary to to uh, broaden the to the view to what they actually did in the Ottoman Empire in this period. So they were um, financing the the largest German projects in the Ottoman Empire, which was the Baghdad Railway and the Anatolian Railway. Um, they um, they worked hand in hand with the most important companies in the construction of the um, the railway. For example, the Philipp Holzmann or Friedrich Krupp AG and others. Um, and the Deutsche Bank, on the other hand, founded companies such as the German Levantine uh, Cotton Company and the Anatolian Industrial and Trading Company in order to influence the manufacturing economy of the Ottoman Empire. So they had a very deep interest in getting involved more and more in the Ottoman Empire. And I think that a mention within these um, secret negotiations would have uh, been a threat to their involvement and investments in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and that's connected to the political regime at these, at these days in the Ottoman Empire, which was trying to, to get rid of the influence of, of um, nations from abroad, actually on Ottoman soil. And the other hand would be um, the position of the Royal Museums. And that's maybe the, the link to the, your second question. Um, so how would I situate this story of the neg uh, secret negotiations within the museum history or history of collecting? And um, Theodor Wiegand is a very special and uh, interesting figure in these uh, or regarding these questions as he served as the Royal Museum's uh, direct museums director abroad in the Ottoman Empire from 1897 to 1911. And he um, was able to, to really found a basement of, of um, a huge influence in the Ottoman Empire, not only to the representatives of the Museum Humayun, but also to um, Ottoman politicians and um, other persons. And he was like the central figure for the Royal Museums in their appropriation strategies in the Ottoman Empire in these days. Um, and I think that it's a bit, or we could connect it to what Hannah Arendt actually said in the or origins of totalitarianism, when she said that expansion or analyzed expansion within the historical context of imperialism as a permanent and supreme aim of politics as the central political idea of imperialism. And I would transfer this idea to the museums because they were trying to expand their collections. And actually, uh, Theodor Wiegand was the agent of the Royal Museums in Istanbul and tried everything to expand the collection of Berlin um, regarding antiquity. So he was pretty much involved in this um, colonial or imperial um, appropriation program. And once the political circumstances and the antiquity law um, prevented any legal transfers of antiquities from the Ottoman Empire, he searched and directed other ways to, to um, appropriate 
things or objects from the Ottoman Empire. And these secret negotiations would have been one option to get the most prestigious finds of the Museum of Jun. And his involvement in the act in the First World War actually is something like a shift in this perception. Already in, in the course of the translocation of the Mashata facade, one uh, German archaeologist um, um, argued for um, the purchase of all the antique sites in Syria by the German Empire so that they would be the responsible uh, state or nation for the preservation of these uh, antique sites. And Wigand actually was able, within the course of the First World War under Ahmed Jemal Pasha, um, to take care of these objects, but he was not able to collect anything for the Royal Museums as he was so close to Ahmed Jemal and Ahmed Jemal would have would, wouldn't have allowed any objects to, to, to go to Berlin. So he, um, he needed to be very careful and he took it very serious to, um, yeah, to get this idea or to realize the idea of uh, take care of the objects and preserve them on site, to be able to um, exploit them scientifically and um, yeah, to, to lay a basement for future tourism, for example, in the idea of Ahmed Jemal. And I think that's my answer. Thank you so much, Sebastian. I could speak to you um, for another hour about this topic. I mean, I think this microcosmic uh, story that you've given us is so fascinating and tells us so much about what was happening at that time. Um, perhaps we can carry on this conversation further uh, at another time. Uh, but I think time is of the essence, isn't that right? Uh, and so we will move to the next paper, uh, which is uh, Jeran Abi's uh, paper. Jeran Abi, uh, the idiosyncratic case of archaeology in Istanbul under occupation. Your paper was so interesting in the way that it addresses a situation of archaeology and its practices in a period of conflict, in a period um, of warfare. All kinds of illegal activities took place, um, as you've pointed out, and everybody was digging and transporting antiquities um, because they saw themselves as the legitimate heirs of the antiquities in this re region, and you explained that uh, beautifully. Um, it's remarkable the extent to which these ideas still remain today, and I wonder if you've been following through into later uh, time periods, the, the, the kind of sense of entitlement permitting digging and transporting of things um, that were argu arguably illegal practices, as you um, have pointed out. Um, so I'm curious about this notion of uh, protection and rescue that they had. Um, and how it was used and how this is uh, different uh, from the statements about antiquities um, before the, the period of the war or uh, the difference between what was happening in, in Istanbul under occupation uh, and elsewhere. Uh, you brought up the issue of the World War I uh, bombings in Europe and how these were considered to be barbaric acts and that they didn't want to, the allies didn't want to seem to be like them. Uh, but if that's the case, I'm just curious about how this would apply outside of Istanbul as well, or were the regions outside of Istanbul not of a similar concern with regard to looking like barbarians? Um, and the, my last question to you is about the technologies that were being developed that you mentioned. And you said there were new technologies arising. And I, what I would like to ask you is if you know anything more about aerial surveillance and aerial documentation of archeological sites by the military at this time during the First World War. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Bahrani, uh, for, for your um, questions and, and comments. Um, one thing I think I need to emphasize uh, more is that 
the the concept was like a, a, the the care of cultural heritage was definitely not a new thing, especially during you know um, a conflict. You know, uh, it was very much um, uh, known uh, since Napoleon ran ransacked uh, you know European collections. But what it became when it became very um, poignant was the war. It's kind of becomes a turning point because of. Uh, uh, this uh, the acts of Germans in um, in early in the war in Belgium and how much this uh, was used as a propaganda tool by the uh, the British and the Americans at, af afterwards. So not looking like a German barbarian specifically uh, was became uh, extremely extremely important. And so why in they they care about not looking like barbarians in Istanbul, but not elsewhere. I think the uh, key is perhaps that um, uh, the other places, in most, most of the other places that they did, uh, they engaged in archeological excavations was uh, that it, those places were going to be their future mandates. So they had already claims on this. And as we know in the Iraqi case, uh, for example, they, they already started, you know, thinking about uh, creating a museum. Gertrude Bell was already in situ at this time that we, I'm talking about, you know, uh, doing. So uh, they could justify the fact that like, OK, yes, we are sending some of the stuff, for example, we found in Iraq uh, to um, to the British Museum, but we are also creating a, a museum in Baghdad, too. So they were able to justify these type of things. And because Istanbul was not going to be um, at this point in time, at least that I'm talking about, do, uh, middle to the late occupation of Istanbul, uh, it was decided that Istanbul was going to be left alone. It was not going to belong to anyone. So they were able to um, um, look high and mighty uh, in, in that specific location. Um, um, and uh, other thing, I mean, uh, because this is a short uh, presentation, I did not talk about lots and lots of different other very um, embarrassing episodes, like very well known, the Sardis affair uh, with, with the Americans. Um, and um, their uh, Americans did look bad uh, and they had to um, uh, do something about it. Um, and this, um, uh, one of my arguments that I, I do argue elsewhere that uh, I think it's the mandate system that this allowed uh, creation of an international law that regulated this type of behavior. Um, and it had to like wait until World War II uh, to, to happen uh, because League of Nations uh, did you know, set up uh, committees and, and whatnot to uh, deal with a restitution of um, uh, antiquities, but by the German ones. They did not uh, set up any committees uh, about the British, what the British take away or the, what the French take away, just the winners kind of uh, set up the um, parameters of uh, what was possible and what is allowed to talk about, basically. Thank you. Right. I mean, that, that definitely um, coincides with what I've found in my work on Iraq. I mean, what you say uh, definitely resonates with, with uh, the, what I've seen in the Iraqi example. But what I found fascinating about what you're saying about the Istanbul situation is the difference actually sheds a great deal of light on the Iraqi example, on the Mesopotamian example. So, so that, um, in fact, opens up um, an area of investigation or of thought uh, that's that's quite useful. So just before I let you go, I just want to ask you about aerial images. I'm going to push you more yes. about this. Sorry, I I um, forgot about it. Uh, yes, this is the this is the time when uh, the beginnings of the aerial warfare is uh, invented, being invented. But at the same time. Aerial archaeology is invented uh, uh, thanks to World War One in a weird, weird um, side benefit uh, of the war, um, and uh, the, the the British do it, the um, the Germans do it, and I put uh, two examples of it, um, and I did not have any chance to go uh, look at the. Uh, uh, German archives, so we can ask Sebastian more about that if he come across any um, 
a study of that if um, and if the German monument commander, I mean, I know that they, they, that they did use um, um, uh, aircrafts uh, to do so, but like to what extent, um, uh, you know, who paid for it, where they how how willing the governments were willing to use that, or it was just like a, a win win situation. So oh, so we can talk about that. Um, the, for in the fact, British I just want to butt in and say, d you do realize that these declassified older Im military images are now being used widely by archaeologists today, just so that they're actually, you know, in practice as we're speaking. Yeah, I, it's it's fa it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. So um, the about the French, I um, I uh, I don't know because while I was doing uh, this research, they were uh, trying to uh, uh, digitize their collection, so I didn't get to look at those files. But I bet I bet the the, the, the French did it too. It's it's really exciting um, thing that I really need to look more into. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Terrific talk. Thanks. Um, so uh, for the final paper, we had uh, Kamal Baran speaking to us about the Makdeld Meling Turkish letters in the Bryn Mawr archive. Uh, Kamal, you gave us a really interesting view into the life and relationships of Makdeld Meling in the early 1950s. Um, based on the exchange of letters and greeting cards with people in the community with whom uh, she worked. So my question to you is, do you think that Machteld Melling can be taken as an example of a kind of early or mid 20th century archeologist with her practices, um, her relationships with her uh, workers with the people of the community. Can we take the Machteld Melling example as something representative of what archaeologists working in Turkey or in the Middle East at large, um, what was happening? Or um, is she similar to other European archaeologists working in the region at the time or not? Um, how did they? What was the attitude at the time um, of archaeologists uh, with regard to their field staff or their colleagues in the region? Um, so, I mean, all of this is to take us to the larger question of what we can learn from her archive. And um, the, uh, the second question I have for you is how does this small window um, of the life from 1952 to 54, I think you said, um, of the life of Magdald Melling from her archive. This is just a very tiny uh, window into her life. So how can we understand um, what you have uh, been explaining to us from her archive in relationship to the remainder of her life, to her as a scholar and an archeologist working in uh, Turkey. Thanks. Thank you very much for the question. Um, for the first question, like how a representative Magnet would be, Magnet Menik would be in terms of uh, archeological practice happening in the 1950s, I would say compared to, um, if I were to compare her to other uh, figures such as George Hoffman of the um, former director of Sardis excavations or Kurt Bittel uh, of the um, uh, Hattusha excavations, their um, personal archives did not reveal such um, personal or, or, or intimate, let's say, um, nature of relationships with the local community. So, in that sense, uh, I would say Menlik's case would be uh, uh, would not necessarily fit into the general um, picture of things. But one thing, uh, what is special in the um, Magdad Menlik case, I would say, is that she never really um, uh, participated in these excavations as the um, as the director. So, and she uh, continued and conducted several different field work in different places in Turkey, at the, on, yeah, more or less um, at the same time. So in that sense, she had um, more access to different groups of local communities in contrast to other of, um, European or American archaeologists, archaeologists would have. 
So in that sense, it's uh, the uh, personal archive also uh, reflects that aspect as well. And one thing that is also different from other archaeologists is that um, is the nature of the archive that we are uh, talking about. So here it's her uh, personal estate, her personal papers, and um, as you know, um, as part of the nature of the, that uh, archive, the scholarship, the scholarly papers, the scholarly uh, documents, and all personal documents are all merged in that particular uh, archive. Whereas in different uh, examples, such as let's say, again, I would give the um, same example um, in the um, Sardis ex excavations um, uh, carried out by Harvard Art Museums, it, it, they uh, keep two different archives. So they have the uh, more archeological archive and the personal uh, archive of the director, George Hoffman. So, here um, in the Mende case, the, the boundaries are much uh, more uh, blurred, I would say. As uh, for the second question, um, what can um, the practice uh, inform us, particularly to, 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 to the contemporary um, archaeological practices, is that I one of the things that I um, stressed out uh, in my dissertation is that the starting from the 1990s, the whole um, with the um, current debates of public archaeology and the um, outreach, community outreach. Uh, Menning's papers, particularly this folder, relationship with local communities, does have um, clues for um, basically public archaeology before it was called uh, public archaeology. Uh, in this case, uh, it is not uh, carried out institutionally or on, or on, um, on a, um, basically in the frame of um, legal uh, boundaries, but through informal and personal connections. And that's, I think, would be one of the takeaways that the uh, contemporary um, heritage studies and, and uh, public archaeology could take, that it really starts at the very, uh, even in cases where archaeology is not necessarily involved other than, um, this is uh, other than um, preparing the, the interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking to us about this um, truly fascinating woman, Magdalt Melling. Um, and now I will pass the microphone to uh, Zena Merva. I think she's frozen. <clears throat> Mary, you're in charge of the question and answer period. She, her screen is frozen, Zaina. Yes, it is. Yes, so maybe I will start then. Um, let's see, there is one question here, which is very interesting. And I think each one of you may have to address this. It's by Yatemin Akçagüler. He says, I understand that Wigan was also instrumental in acquiring a number of Ottoman manuscripts now housed at the University of Hamburg. To the whole panel, she asks, how do you compare the politics of colonial acquisition, extraction of antiquity, to that of Ottoman manuscripts. We have debates about the restitution of, restitution of antiquities, but not really of manuscripts. I'm wondering what you think that is. Myra, I took over because you were frozen, but now you can uh, unmute yourself. Bad timing. <laughs> So who, anyone would like to take uh, Yasemin's um, question? I, I can say a few words. It's, I'm not going to be able to directly answer it, uh, but um, I remember, I, mean, I have never encountered anything about the manuscripts in my own archival research. 
However, I remember reading in uh, Punar Ure's work, which I'm like a super big fan of. Uh, she is, uh, her dissertation was on, uh, called uh, Byzantine Heritage, Archaeology and Politics of, um, between Russia and Ottoman Empire. And uh, she, she recently published her, her book too. And she uh, focused on the Russian Archaeological Institute in Istanbul, and which um, uh, did excavations during the war um, in, in Trabzon, in uh, you know, eastern regions of, um, of, of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, so I remember one little detail uh, that fascinated me in that work that the Russians um, took Ottoman manuscript, Islamic manuscripts, uh, especially to use it as a bargaining tool later. So I, I, I don't know, I don't remember the details of like what happened afterwards. They act, did they actually use those manuscripts as the bargaining chips? I think they did, uh, but it might be a good place to uh, look uh, at uh, that particular dissertation or, 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 or the book afterwards, Punar Ure. I wonder if Sebastian has an answer for this. Um, yes, actually, I wanted to say something too, because, um, well, um, Yasmin mentioned uh, Vigand, and actually, it's a, I think it's a part of a bigger or broader story, because German um, scholars who were dealing with manuscripts from the Ottoman Empire, of course, wanted to step in into what the museums did too. So they wanted to acquire manuscripts for the German collections or for the German libraries. And Wigand was um, kind of responsible for these acquisitions during his reign in Istanbul as well. Um, and it started, or one story started in 1898 when um, Wilhelm II um, did his second trip to the Ottoman Empire, while um, German scholars tried to get access to the treasure dome, I think in Arabic, and excuse my bad Arabic, it's Hubert uh, al and um, it's in the Umayyad Mosque in uh, Damascus. Um, and actually the Germans were allowed to get access to the Christian manuscripts in, which were stored in this um, uh, treasure dome, but not to the Islamic ones. And the Ottomans um, kept first the Islamic ones in the treasure dome while others were sent to um, Berlin for re reconstruction purposes but with the claim that they were sent back immediately after they were reconstructed or conserved. Um, but the Germans, of course, tried to keep them in, in Berlin. Um, but the, German, uh, the Ottomans didn't forget about the thing, so they asked them back. And it's kind of the first, maybe one of the first restitutions of manuscripts which happened in, in the course of 1909, 1910, I think. Um, and they were sent back. And during the course of the First World War, when uh, Vigand was present in Damascus, his unit, which at these days uh, was called 19th Bureau of the Fourth Ottoman Army, or Formation Vigand in German, uh, which later get this propagandistic term of German Ottoman or German Turkish Monument Protection Command, um, they were involved in the translocation of manuscripts from this treasure dome to Istanbul in 1907. Um, 1918. And also German scholars tried to exploit the presence of uh, Vigan to get access to uh, monasteries or other places in uh, today's Syria or Iraq to get access to the, to the manuscripts. And um, they either tried to take photographs of them for scientific purposes or to get to, to purchase them for the collection of uh, German libraries. And actually, um, I wanted to mention two um, publications because in 2020, the Damascus manuscripts were uh, published or there was an, uh, an anthology published in 2020 by Ariana Dottone Rambach, Konrad Hirschler and Orni Folland. And then actually uh, to come back to the restitution um, claim or question, um, I think Hegner Seitlian Wartenpau uh, published this Daytun gospel um, book, um, I think the missing pages is the name, and I think that's kind of one of the initial claims to or restit or the the initial initiatives to for the restitution of manuscripts which were um, yeah taken or 
transferred under other metric um, power relations. So I think it's it's coming. Um, yeah, the debate is coming or starting or started already, actually. I would like to add something, if I may. Um, I don't really have any um, experience working with the manuscripts, but the answer might be also um, somehow connected with the fact that um, repatriation uh, efforts of antiquities, most um, one of their strongest arguments is that the um, pieces, whether it be it's architectural pieces or uh, statues or portraits, they were um, in antiquity produced specifically place-based. So they were produced uh, to be seen in a certain setting, in a certain um, environment, certain landscape. And that might necess not be necessarily the case for um, manuscripts, which might not uh, be related with the, um, uh, their efforts in rep repatriation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think, um, unfortunately, our time is up. I mean, we can just keep uh, talking about these really interesting issues. And I myself have so many questions. Uh, but um, thank you very much uh, for uh, great presentations and Professor Bahrani uh, for your comments and questions. Um, so um, this is the end of our panel, but uh, we would like to remind our audience that our uh, this webinar will be uh on youtube on just a few weeks in a few days so uh so um thank you very much and the collective thank you from me to all of you and to our attendees thank you